task and my great pleasure to introduce um, our speaker for the evening. Um, uh, I also want to mention that um, our provost, Dr. Lily McNair, is here with us. Um, it's an absolute pleasure to be working with her. Um, uh, Rabbi Eli Confer uh, is a graduate of the Jewish Theological Seminary, um, where he has his ordination from. I believe you're pursuing a PhD as well there. He is, though, especially known in not only the metropolitan, but the national, and even perhaps international, certainly in Israel, um, Jewish communities, as someone who's gone beyond denomination in his thinking, beyond the definitions of reform, conservative, orthodox, or even secular, cultural, the words we like to use in the Jewish communities to describe ourselves. And every community, every ethnic community, has its labels and its affiliations institutionally. Um, that it uses to describe itself, he's gone beyond those kinds of labels and is rethinking what it means to be an affiliated, committed um, American Jew um, and to be involved deeply in that tradition without the kinds of institutional connections uh, that many of us take for granted. And he represents a growing trend which he will delineate for you. He is not alone. There are hundreds of thousands of young people following this idea and living active Jewish lives outside of the institutions uh, you and I uh, maybe take for granted in Jewish life today. He is a founder of institutions himself, Machon Hadar, uh, the first um, egalitarian uh, yeshiva. He'll describe what that means for us. Um, he speaks um, around the country on this, but most of all he leads communities. There are, what, 80 or 90 of these communities now um, around the country on this matter, and his book on being sold outside this lecture hall has really been formative in, in, in providing a text, a set of guideposts about how to think about Jewish identity today. And for students here, whether Jewish or not, the idea of an assimilating community, such as the American Jewish community, descendants of immigrants in the 1880s and afterwards, uh, mostly from Eastern Europe, um, you know, some 130 years later, where are we um, as an ethnic community today in terms of how we think about our own civic life, our own communal life, um, and by definition, then more broadly, our own participation um, as Jews um, in the broader American panoply of um, cultural and spiritual expression. So with that, I'm really, really excited that Rabbi Confer is with us as a leader in this field. Inviting me, and, and thank you all for, for coming here tonight, especially those of you whose name wasn't called on attendance roll. <laughs> um, of your own free will. That's more or less the subject that we're going to be talking about: what happens to religion when you're not required to show up. Um, so I want to just speak a little broadly about um, the sociological moment that we find ourselves in, and those of you who are uh, entering college can. Uh, either ratify this or, or challenge me on where we are uh, in sort of describing the American cultural scene, of which, of course, Jews are a part of. Um, but I think I want to set the stage by describing that a little bit, uh, leading up to the, the question about what is going to happen to denominations and what is going to happen to synagogues in a world of the following culture. So I'll start off by saying that 30 is the new 20. That is to say, it's good news for those of you in your 30s, um, uh, unless 20s is a bad time. Um, the, the idea here is that um, in, let's say, 30 years ago, the path was pretty clear, right? You go to high school, you go to college, you get a job, you marry somebody who you met in college or high school, you have kids, you move to the suburbs, you're done, right? More or less, general trends. Um, the average age um, on marriage over the last 20 years has risen from 22 to 27. Um, so there is uh, a delay in reaching sort of the, the, the signposts of what it means to live an independent life as defined by general society. That's marriage, that's having kids, and that's also having a steady job. Um, the average number of jobs for people in their 20s is seven. That's average, <laughs> okay, right? So you can imagine the, the intense mobility that is around um, the workforce entry as a you know, contrast to a generation or two ago when people would join a particular company, they'd hang out there for 40 years, and then you'd retire with a pension. Um, you're living in an age where mobility is, um, is the idiom that we're all working in. And I would speak about that also geographically. Right? Staten Island is probably uh, you know, part of this trend where 
people don't necessarily stay in the place where they grow up. I grew up in Providence, Rhode Island. I am not returning to Providence, Rhode Island in any foreseeable future. And generally, the, the number of places that young people move is extremely high. So you, you're living in a world um, where um, people are taking a longer time to reach uh, the sort of critical milestones of mature adulthood. They're moving around. They're not settling down and having kids. Um, and, uh, and they're essentially not in a world where the logical thing to do is to identify by affiliating to a traditional institution, whether that is your synagogue or any other number of, uh, you know, Rotary Club, the Bowling League, you know, famous sociology has done around that. Uh, the whole idea of everything is in flux. And I would add one other uh, important cultural element. We're obviously living in the world of the internet. And the internet, I would say, has two practical implications for the environment we're talking about. Number one, it's a startup environment, right? Everybody has their own blog, their own you know, uh, way of communicating their take on, on life. That is what open access information does from the supply side. And from the demand side, there's basically no limit to information, right? You have information at your fingertips no matter what you are looking for, it's on the internet. It's not a world where there are limited places to get your, uh, your sense about what's going on in the world. Um, now I'll just bring this to the Jewish uh, question for one second. Um, Jewish people themselves have experienced another critical shift, which is being Jewish is a desirable ethnic identity. Um, that is to say, non-Jews are joining JDate, which is the Jewish um, dating <laughs> online service, to meet Jews, right? This isn't what the founders had in mind when they did JDate. But that, what that is talking about is a world in which it's actually a desirable thing to bring home a Jew to your non-Jewish family. Um, this, you know, we're talking about in, uh, in the reception earlier about the idea of, you know, when Wagner College, not so long ago, there were very, very few Jews on campus, and it was, uh, it was the kind of place where Jews were not welcome in certain environments like this, you know, the sports arena, etc. Um, that, uh, you know, sort of latent anti-Semitism, although not completely disappeared, um, you know, you do not have a situation of Jewish law firms forming because non-Jews wouldn't take them in, or all the, think of all the Jewish hospitals, right? Mount Sinai and all that stuff. That was formed because the Jews weren't allowed into the general society. We are not living in that world anymore. So for Jews who are living in a world of basically complete and open opportunity in American society, you have a very significant situation going on, and this brings us to the impact on denominations and synagogues. What you have crashing together is a, um, a new form of, uh, of life that doesn't have a name necessarily yet, or people are debating about what the name is, but it's essentially the post-college, pre-married with kids, extending period of time. So you have people who are bouncing around in this time, searching for identity beyond the college years, who are not your typical candidates to join your stable institutions like a synagogue. Um, and that is a very significant uh, impact. And the other impact is basically, I don't need to join anything to express my Jewish identity. I'm not forced to join a synagogue to say I'm Jewish, right? I can be Jewish when I'm dating my Italian girlfriend. I'm Jewish, she's Italian, it's a lovely world, right? So I don't have to join my synagogue, which may, or now maybe less so, would look askance at such a relationship uh, to say, yes, I'm Jewish. I can be Jewish in any number of ways that goes beyond paying dues to an institution, okay? So that's the world that we're living in here where Jews are operating. Um, and I think that um, for traditional institutions such as the synagogue or the day school, or denominations uh, at large, it is in some ways a threatening environment if what you care about is the survival of the institution. So let me just play this out for you for one second. Right? Jewish life has been organized um, uh, you know, since, really since 19th century Germany, but really since the, the early 20th century in, in America, has been really organized around three major denominations. Reform, conservative, and orthodox, okay? And depending on where you came from, if you were coming from Eastern Europe, you are coming from Germany, you were going to ally with one of those denominations. Uh, eventually, the denominations actually tried to um, 
uh, in an American idiom, were more than just a cultural association of, well, the German Jews go this way and the Eastern European Jews go th this way, but they also express an ideology, right? An ideology that was across a spectrum of what it means to, uh, to be Jewish. Are you traditional? Do you believe that God commands you to do certain acts? Or are you more open to the general society? Do you believe that uh, Judaism can be reformed, can be changed, can be updated? Um, and somewhere along that spectrum, people would identify ideologically. Um, but now, we're, and sort of how do those denominations express themselves? They would express themselves in rabbinic training programs. So, if, for instance, if I go to the Jewish Theological Seminary, it means I'm centrist, right? It means I have an ideology. <laughs> Um, or if I join this synagogue or this temple, it means that I'm subscribing to this particular point of view of Jewish life. But this is where things start to break down on that front. A, people don't need to ascribe to a particular vision within Judaism represented by these big three denominations to have a rich Jewish identity. And I would say more significantly, the more general you are, the less compelling you are. Or to put it another way, think about network news for a second, right? Network news, ABC, CBS, NBC. Do any of the freshmen need any translation on that? Mm -hmm. Right, and this, these are, the, when people used to show up for dinner, they would sit in front of the television, and you'd have one of three choices for where you're going to get your news source, right? If you wanted to find out what was going on, you had one of three choices. Now, you can choose a bazillion number of news sources that's completely tailored to your interests, right? So the big expression, a big ideological camp, a big network news analog, which is represented by a, you know, a, a um, trio of denominations that are trying to claim all of American Jewry, numbering around six million, um, is just less compelling if you actually care about the expression of your Jewish life in some amount of nuance. So in other words, if I actually care about how I would express my Jewish life, a big tent uh, representation of ideology is certainly less compelling than my specific approach to Jewish life. Uh, and this is, again, challenging to a religious um, uh, uh, network that was organized around big tent, right? If I'm trying to grab everybody from over here to over here, and I really belong over here, it's not so um, compelling for me to join into a religious institution that's going to be much wider than my particular passion. Okay? So this is the problem, I think, that's facing denominations and synagogues in general. And just to spell out the synagogue uh, problem a little, a little further, I would say this. Why do people join a synagogue? Well, this is a great time of year to talk about it, right? Why do I join a synagogue? Because i got to go to synagogue on Yom Kippur, right? <laughs> if I don't go to synagogue on Yom Kippur, I don't know what will happen. Well, why do I go to synagogue on Yom Kippur? That's what Jews do, right? And then it turns out that's not exactly what all Jews do, right? So you have a world in which people decide, well, my Yom Kippur, I was talking to somebody a couple weeks ago, my Yom Kippur is going to be in Bali, okay? Now, compared to joining a synagogue and plopping down $2,000, Bali looks pretty good, right? So you have a world in which I can express what it means for me to have a, you know, day of awe outside of the normal institutional world of the synagogue. Um, this is, again, I would say the culture of the internet where things are um, more specifically defined as opposed to everybody showing up in the big box. So now why do I join the synagogue? Well, I would join the synagogue if the synagogue itself offered a compelling vision or a compelling um, worship experience, right? And that's where you start to see the successful synagogues and the not-so-successful synagogues. I would say, originally synagogues weren't set up to express Jewish identity. Originally, I'm talking thousands of years ago, synagogues were set up to actually express a place where people go to have a relationship with God and with each other. Right? So to the extent that a synagogue is actually accomplishing that, then people are, in fact, joining that synagogue. But to the extent that the worship is, tell me if this sounds you know, uh, familiar, where you show up at synagogue and you're really there to talk in the back because the, you know, what's happening on stage, as it were, is really not that compelling. Well, why do I have to pay the membership in the first place? Right? That's sort of the thinking that goes around the calculus of moving from an, an identity-based reason to join a synagogue to a meaning-based reason to join a synagogue. If, if synagogue is an expression of meaning, then I'm going to judge the synagogue on how well it executes meaning. 
And it's not the kind of automatic dues paying flow that you might have benefited from from the synagogue side in the 50s. Um, now that's all I would say on the, on the threatening side or on the um, you know, institutionally challenging side. But let me talk a little bit about um, what this has made room for. And you could be the arbiter about whether this is a good thing or a bad thing for Jewish life. Um, I'll tell a little bit of my own story as a way of just getting into the what do we do in this vacuum of a widening age range where people feel uh, not settled in their life identity and less compelling reasons to join a synagogue. Um, so I moved, in, uh, I moved to New York in 1996 um, and I moved to the village. Um, and you know, my, my dad is a rabbi, my mom is a Bible teacher. I come from a fairly engaged Jewish home. Um, and I just spent a year in Israel and I really spent uh, that time experienced a Judaism of passion and deep religious meaning. You know, people in Israel, uh, well, I would say 20% of the people in Israel are really serious about their religion. 80% <laughs> of the people in Israel could take it or leave it. But I was hanging out with the 20%. And it was once you sort of get a taste of what it means to engage in a religious life that's based on meaning, you're sort of drawn into that approach. So I went to various synagogues in the village and I would say that I was not compelled by the offering that they were doing on the worship side or on the learning side. Um, and when I would go, I would go kind of like for the free kiddish food because I was like a 22 year old guy. Um, but, uh, but, but ultimately that wasn't really enough to keep me in the walls and so I ended up um, sort of creating my own Sabbath experience, um, which really wasn't synagogue based itself. It was basically a day of rest where I wouldn't, I wouldn't go to work, but I wasn't really engaging in the sort of traditional institutional structure. Um, and uh, I moved around, I lived on the east side, I moved to the west side. Um, when I turned 27, um, I reconnected with an old friend of mine from college, and in college we had worked together to, uh, to run a, uh, the, the, the college minion, the college prayer group. Um, this was at Harvard. And so um, the, the, the reconnection with my old friend made me ask, why can't we go back to those days in college um, when we were actually doing this ourselves and creating a worship experience that we, we liked because we were in charge? And so he said, good idea, let's do it. So the two of us, plus another a friend of ours, got together in a bar. Um, this was back in 2001. Um, and we mapped out what our ideal religious service could be. Two weeks later, um, I sent around an email. Um, this is back when people read email. Um, so I sent an email to a bunch of friends. They forwarded it to a bunch of other friends. We showed up at his apartment two weeks later, and there were 60 people there. Now, 60 people, I didn't even know more than 20 of them. This was the power of what it meant to, A, use the internet back when people were reading email, and B, um, we had hit upon something where people who were coming to this apartment were basically in their 20s. I was 27. Uh, I was on the older end. And, um, and they were looking for something that they weren't getting in their synagogue. And this was the Upper West Side of Manhattan. There was no, you know, no shortage of synagogue offerings there. Right? So what was this particular uh, you know, uh, minion um, drawing people in to do? Uh, it was basically a combination of three things. Number one, it was a traditional service. That is to say, it did not use the conservative liturgy or the reform liturgy. It used the orthodox liturgy. So it was straight up you know, sort of traditional liturgy, the traditional prayer book. Number two, it counted men and women as equal citizens in the prayer life. So a woman could lead the prayers as equal as a man could lead the prayers. This is a fairly new innovation in, you know, in, the, in the arc of Jewish history, um, but uh, was really brought to you by the feminist movement um, you know, in the 70s. Um, and that was a, a core value there. So you had a traditional liturgy. You had men and women participating equally. And then the third part, which I would say is um, the hardest to describe, but probably the most important, um, was that there was some vibrancy, some life, to the worship experience itself. Um, and that was critical because nobody wanted to show up to go through the motions. People wanted to show up because they were yearning for some connection to holiness and to divinity and to something greater than themselves. And Jewish prayer actually offers a pathway towards that. I had seen it in Israel, I experienced it here and there, and I wanted to, to sort of make sure that any service that we were 
founding had that as a core, uh, a core area. What, what, what are some of the components of that? I would say it's, it's a lot of stuff that gets to aesthetics. And here you can argue about aesthetics. There's, you know, there's, uh, there's, there's no judging for taste, as they say. Um, but I think this is what people were sort of coalescing around. Um, number one, there was music. It wasn't musical instruments, which sort of drown out the voices oftentimes, but it, there was a musical aspect to the worship. It wasn't just a mumble, and it wasn't a silent reading with your eyes. Okay? Um, there was an experience of a leader who was in the middle of the prayer group, not at the front, who was, everybody was facing the same way, instead of somebody sort of facing at you and praying at you. And we all had some sort of unified direction for our worship experience. Um, there was a sense of um, participation. That is to say, everybody felt empowered to jump in and sing along, and it wasn't that you were going to cede your experience to somebody who was leading you from the front. Now this coincided with the fact that there was no rabbi. And here, and I speak with respect to rabbis, I myself am a rabbi, rabbis tend to speak, have you noticed, long. Um, and so I think that that's both found in the guide to the service itself. I'm going to tell you what page you're on. I'm going to tell you what experience we're about to have. And also the sermon, right? The sermon is the cornerstone of the traditional worship service in America. Um, and we basically condensed the sermon to five minutes. That alone um, was a saleable commodity. Um, so you had a, a situation where the worship was primary. The teaching was there, but reduced to five minutes, as we sort of said, you know, what you get with a lay person who, you know, who's giving a five minute uh, teaching is that sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not, but it's still five minutes. So you can't really go wrong with that. Um, and you ultimately had a people who were coalescing around something that drew their hearts in to the worship service. Um, now, it was, as I said, a youth culture experience. That is to say, almost everybody was in their 20s, and this was not planned in advance. There's certain reasons for why people in their 20s showed up. A, it was our social network. B, it was people who were not already tied into a synagogue. They weren't leaving their synagogue. They were leaving their bedroom, okay? They were basically not doing anything on Saturday in terms of worship, but now they had felt compelled to check out this new thing. And as long as the worship itself was grabbing people, they were going to come back. So what was the story of this particular minion? This minion, which we later named Hadar, which means um, glory, um, is, uh, is still uh, a vibrant minion on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. Um, two things happened. The minion itself grew, and we, that first year in Manhattan, moved to 14 different spaces in one year. Um, why were we moving so quickly? Well, partially because it's impossible to find rent in Manhattan. And another reason is because as we grew, we grew to a space that held the people, the number of people who were actually there. Does this ever sound familiar? Have you ever been into a synagogue where there are 600 seats and 50 people? That was not what we were looking for. Because you really can't have a, an engaging worship service if the room dwarfs the number of people. So we kept moving around to find places that were actually the size of the number of people who showed up. That was one thing that happened. But another thing that happened, which was more significant, is because it was New York, people actually would spend a couple years on the Upper West Side, and then, because they're part of this, uh, you know, the Odyssey years, as David Brooks calls it, you know, this un unmarried, unsettled down group of people, they would move around. So they would move to Boston, and they would move to LA, and they would move to Chicago, and then they would move from Chicago to Boston to LA. What they would do is they would move to the major urban areas across the country, and basically what they did when they got there is, they set up a minion. They set up one of these grassroots Jewish communities that we had done in Manhattan. They were not copycats and they were not uh, carbon copies, but they were basically using the same organizing principle to get young people to engage with a worship experience that was going to be compelling. And now, um, over the last decade, there have been basically more than 100 of these minyanim that have started across the country and also in Israel. Um, and interestingly, also in, in some parts of Europe. Um, what they express is, as I said, the idiom of the startup culture. Why not just start something up? I don't have to do something that's already there. I can start something anew. So that's fundamentally um, what, what ended up happening um, 
for, uh, you know, for the, the arc of the Minyanim. And when you go to any sort of major Jewish urban area now, more likely than not, you will find one of these Minyanim in operation. Now, the, it's not that these Minyanim have solved Jewish life. And I would say here, there was a question mark about the decline of the American synagogue. I'm telling you here, the American synagogue is not going away. It's not. There are 1,600 American synagogues, okay? There are 100 Minyanim, all right? It's, they're just in completely different leagues. But I think that what we're talking about here is a world in which the synagogue is much like NBC News. NBC is not going out of business, but they are not controlling the market share that they used to, right? So it's a world of, uh, in Chris Anderson's um, uh, terminology, the long tail, right? That there are certain, this is in reference to websites on the internet, there are certain you know, uh, websites that are like the New York Times, Huffington Post, are at the top of the curve, but then the internet goes long. And you have websites that are, you know, uh, I'm interested in carpeting and, you know, lecture halls of this size. That's my website over here. It's never going to gain a huge number of people, but I don't have to go to the New York Times to get my news about that. And that's basically where I see some of the future of the religious expression in American Jewish life and really in religion in general is this further segmentation of, of needs. Now, people will say, well, why don't people just come together to the synagogue? The synagogue is meant to be a collection of people who are coming from diverse backgrounds. And why should everybody get to have their own website? Why don't we all go and hang out in the sort of big institutional areas? And there's something appealing to that. So certainly from a communal aspect, I would say from my own uh, experience as a young person, there's something that you lose by not having multiple generations in your worship space. It's just, it's a little weird. It's as if Judaism was invented 10 years ago and we're like, you know, hanging out. You know, it's, it's most synagogues have you know, sort of this question, well, how do I get the young people in? And Hadar was always, how do I get the old people to come here? You know, we had sort of like a, uh, you know, a task force on how can we uh, reach the older, uh, older community. It's, you know, it, it's that sort of bizarro world where you're living in a segmented generational space, which I would say is probably ultimately not healthy. Um, and, of course, synagogues do things that Minyanim absolutely cannot do. And this is where the paid clergy part comes in. These Minyanim are defined by the fact that they don't have any paid staff. There's no paid clergy. They're really their only expense. They're incredibly cheap to operate. Their only expense is rent and kiddush. Okay? And most of the kiddush stuff is pretty cheap. So uh, uh, people aren't coming for the kiddush, unfortunately. So you're basically paying for rent, um, which means that... Um, uh, you're not actually hiring a rabbi. What do you lose? Um, okay, so you lose the long sermon, but you also lose somebody who is trained as a teacher, ideally trained as a teacher, as a pastor, as a counselor, right? People are not actually benefiting from that side of what it means to employ uh, a religious clergy person. Um, and nevertheless, I think people are basically dealing with it. Um, now, um, the other, the other and, and final uh, trend that I sort of just want to um, note here uh, is the, the trend around education. And this gets to the question of, what does it mean to be uh, active in my religious identity if my religious identity is more than bagels and lox? In other words, bagels and lox, everybody's eating bagels and lox, okay? That doesn't make you Jewish anymore, right? Everybody watched Seinfeld, the number one show in America. It's unbelievable, right? You know, uh, um, uh, curb your enthusiasm, right? It's, you know, it's, it's, incredible how the Jewish cultural idiom has exploded onto the sort of uh, general American scene. So what that means is, if I really care about Jewish identity, I can't just be a bagel and lox kind of guy, okay? So what do I do in that vacuum? Well, I start to think about, well, what does it actually mean to be Jewish from a content perspective, right? And that's where you have a very interesting phenomenon um, about 12 years ago, uh, a number of Jewish philanthropists started um, what was incredibly radical in the Jewish world, something called Birthright Israel. Um, Birthright Israel was this basically harebrained idea that we could send every Jewish kid between a certain age and their 20s to Israel. And we'd give it to them for free. Free plane ticket, free food, free bus, free tour, the whole thing 10 days. Okay? It's wildly successful. They've had 250,000 kids go on this trip in the last decade. And what happens as a result of going to Israel? People are opened up to the possibility that Judaism is more than just the bagels and locks identity, right? It's more than just the surface connection. Why am I Jewish? I don't know. I like do good things for people, you know, the sort of like shallow social justice aside of Judaism. So people go to Israel 
They get turned on by something, and then they say, how could I actually learn more about what the content of Judaism is? And that's where there's a huge mismatch between supply and demand. And that's um, sort of the, the last thing I'll say, the last um, um, startup story is the story of Mahon Hadar. Mahon Hadar is, uh, as, as Rabbi Unger said, a, a um, egalitarian yeshiva. Let me just define the terms. Egalitarian means men and women are treated as equals in the program. This is very unusual for yeshivot because almost every yeshiva is male only. Okay, that sort of defines a yeshiva is that it's men and men were traditionally the people who studied in Jewish life. Um, so we decided to have women involved as well and the whole notion of women studying Torah is about 100 years old now and, and is not limited to our one institution but the idea of women and men studying together is fairly unusual. Um, and, the, and the idea of a yeshiva, I'll just define yeshiva, yeshiva is a place that is an immersive learning center. Okay? It's a place where people go, our students go, from 7.30 in the morning to 9 at night. Okay? It's, it's intense. <laughs> okay? And it was always the nerve center of a Jewish content generating experience. So it's not that everybody went to the yeshiva, but the yeshiva would produce certain students who would go out and impact the Jewish community beyond the yeshiva's walls. And that's sort of our idea, is that there are a lot of Jews out there who get turned on to Judaism through birthright or other means. Actually, um, the other major means is Jewish studies classes in college. Um, you know, 40 years ago, there were basically three to five universities that had a serious Jewish studies program. Now, basically every college will find Jews has a Jewish studies program. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. Um, and people get turned on, they say, oh, I didn't know that there was something about Judaism that's actually intellectually engaging. That's not what I got in Hebrew school, right? And now I want to actually have more than just the academic class I took last semester. So what do I do? I'm looking for a place to engage in the wisdom and, uh, of the Jewish heritage. So that's what we're trying to offer in this yeshiva, this, this sort of immersive learning center where people can engage with the content. And because it's the internet age, we of course have all our classes online, and you can, somebody just told me yesterday they spent the year in... Jordan in Amman, and that they, uh, their only Jewish engagement that entire year was listening to our podcast. Okay, so that's not the immersive experience I'm talking about. It's not 7.30 to 9. But there's something, there's some content thirst that's going on out there. So I think the question that I'm sort of leaving you with and leaving myself with is, what can the Jewish institutional structure do to realign around a world in which people don't join because of obligation, but they join out of a search of meaning? And what would it mean for synagogues and other traditional Jewish institutions like a JCC to actually orient around the production of Jewish content as opposed to a sort of shallow engagement with Jewish culture? That's not to say that you're going to capture everybody with that move, but I would say right now the supply and demand is way out of whack. There's many more people who are looking for some deeper connection, to the extent they're looking for anything at all. They're looking for some deeper connection with Jewish content and I would say that the traditional Jewish institutional structure is a little bit lagging in the providing of that. Um, so I don't stand here by saying, I have all the answers, we figured it out. Far from it. I would say that you know, our institution at Mechon Adar is really trying to engage in that content supply. But we can't do it alone, for sure. And I'm really looking forward to a world in which the Jewish institutions, like the synagogue, um, and probably generally the denominations themselves, reinvent themselves around a world of content and meaning instead of uh, obligation and uh, an expected joining. So with that, I'll stop and open up for questions and comments. I'm uh, troubled by a lot of what you've had to say. And uh, my, my, my being troubled has to do with um, uh, tradition in the synagogue, uh, which does not seem to be a part of what you have spoken of. Maybe it is. But just flesh out a little bit more what you mean by tradition in the cinema. Well, um, just the, the age-old uh, observance of uh, Judaism. Um, it's, uh, it goes back a long, long way. And uh, for me, that's very important. That that's for me. And um, uh, what you've had to say is a promotion of um, younger people, for, or for younger people, 
and not for people like me. So how do people like me fit into what you're saying? Right, so I appreciate your question. I would say um, I'm a pretty traditional guy myself. I'm pro-tradition. Um, and I think that uh, while the movement that I've been talking about is non-traditional in its organizing in an American idiom, I would actually say that, you know, we were talking about this earlier, like, you know, you move to a town, there's a synagogue, then there's a breakaway, then there's a breakaway from that synagogue. There's always some sort of regeneration that goes on around the founding of institutions, and this is probably more along the lines of that sort of more organic, you know, uh, ongoing founding of institutions. But I would say that what was actually drawing people to this particular uh, wave, as opposed to, let's say, the Chavura movement of 40 years ago, was actually a, a coalescing around tradition. That's to say, for, for a lot of these people, it was drawing them in because they wanted a more traditional engagement with the power of Judaism, and, and in that way, it was something that was appealing to them. Now, about the age question, I would say there's really nothing, in, in, in my view, that is structurally problematic about having people outside their 20s be a part of this, uh, you know, of this, of this, um, of this movement. Um, and, 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 and I mean, I sort of I did a tongue in cheek, but I was serious about the way that people who are, you know, in these meanim want people who are older to engage. And it's, it's, it's fascinating the way in which there's nothing about the offering that I think is age specific. I mean, anybody of any age could have a religious yearning or want to learn more about Judaism. That's not limited to your 20s. I think that um, there's some level of, I was in Houston um, recently talking to somebody, and he said, I don't want to show up to a place where it's all young people because I'm a little afraid of them. I think there's sort of some mutual distrust that just goes along with any generational divide. And I think that you know once the scales sort of tipped towards, oh, well, this is a youth-heavy environment, um, then it was a place where older people didn't feel comfortable, even though I guarantee you that whenever anybody over the age of 40 showed up and wanted any of these media, they always got an aliyah. <laughs> you know, it's like people were trying to reach out to them. So I don't think there's anything structurally problematic, but there's sort of a deeper question of how much do young people really want to hang out with old, older people, and how much do older people really want to hang out with younger people? You're going to add. Do, do, do you see, excuse, excuse me for adding on, but um, do you see this as being Yeah, well, I mean, in, in, uh, I mean there's, a, there's a parallel sort of uh, situation going on in the Christian um, church, as I understand it, where you had this tendency towards the mega churches, you know, which put the mega synagogues to shame, right? You know, it's like thousands of people showing up, you know, for worship. And then there was this sort of uh, young people's, uh, Robert Wuthnow is a scholar who writes about this, young people who um, gather in very, very small groups, almost as a reaction to that. Um, that uh, are, are more startup, more grassroots, um, less clergy focused. Now there I would say that, you know, uh, in the Christian church that I'm describing, the megachurch movement anyways, there is certainly a drive towards meaning. In other words, they're not just going through the motions in those services, they're very charismatic type of clergy-led experiences. And nevertheless, people were looking for something a little more intimate. So I think there is some sort of desire for intimacy, desire for close together that is paralleled um, in, in another religious movement of the age. Yeah, back. You, you give your speech mostly about the religious element here in the United States and the young people, but it seems to me there's a bigger thing happening, and that is that everything seems to be moving further and further to the right. Now, talking about Christians as well as Jews, and uh, it's all in response to the Obama presidency. We had the first black president ever elected in the United States, and the effect this has had on the country and everything. Uh, some people say it's good, some people say it's bad, but there's a reaction to it, and it's moving further to the right. Uh, yeah, well, it's interesting. Whether they'll, whether they'll stop him from getting another, another uh, uh, term in office, we don't know yet. But uh, there is a movement towards the right of a lot of people, and it's, it's frightening. Yeah, well, I think that the, I mean, you're pointing to a general trend in religion, which is basically a cratering of the middle. I mean, the conservative movement, which represents the middle of the Jewish denominational spectrum, is the fastest shrinking denomination among the Jewish denominations, and people are basically moving right and left. Uh, I would say, you know, obviously the most uh, popular Jewish movement of the age is no Jewish movement right now, and I'm not talking about someone like me, I'm talking about people who just drop out completely, uh, who just completely disengage and say there's nothing here for me. Um, I would say that's probably a, uh, uh, a lack of um, a, a good supply side chain 
in terms of what Jewish life could be. But I think that the, the trending right uh, of, of, you know, of religion in general is, it may or may not be reflective. Sorry? Mostly politically. Not so much what they do when they're in the synagogue and they pray, or you, would you like to have us to get young people involved, something like that, which is good. But uh, what they do when they go to a polling place to vote, and what, what uh, newspapers they read, what columnists they read, it, it's, it's become more and more conservative. Right. So th there's obviously a, uh, you know, uh, there's some correlation between political right wing and religious right wing, although I'm not sure that this particular move I'm describing has that as a, uh, as a correlation. It's, it's, it's a fairly left wing political group. We did some survey stuff on them in 2007, and it's more traditional religiously. But anyways. Please. Um, you were talking about content and meaning. I need an example of what kind of content. Content is it biblical studies? Is it Talmudic studies? Is it history of the Jews? You didn't give us an example of content, and I want to know what kind of meaning are they looking for? <laughs> Great, I appreciate it. I think. Um, look, we're about to head into Yom Kippur. Um, Yom Kippur is defined by praying. Um, now, you can engage in praying in one of two ways. You could basically engage with the content and meaning and power of the words, or you could engage with the Kiddush. The problem on Yom Kippur is there's no Kiddush. So you're really, you know, you're stuck. So that's why there's a lot of talking. Um, I, I, so to give you an example of the first category here, I would say, let's take the prayer Unatana Tokev. Right? Unatana Tokev is one of the highlight prayers of the Jewish Yom Kippur experience. It's the prayer where people say, you know, who shall live and who shall die? Who by fire, who by water? It's the sort of moment of, wow, I'm standing here uh, reflecting on the fact that I will not live forever and people don't, uh, you know, don't necessarily make it to the next Yom Kippur. Um, now you can say that prayer in a prayerful way and you can study that prayer in a way that is true to the poetic uh, um, you know, aspects of, it's, it's ultimately a poem that was written. Um, you, can, you can look at the biblical references, you can think about the deeper meaning of what it means to say, you know, prayer, penitence, and good deeds will uh, avert the severity of the decree. There's all sorts of questions that you can ask about a powerful prayer like that. But most people don't ever have the chance because it's not really on the agenda, um, you know, of, of, uh, of Jewish institutions. You say it, and then you move on. Um, so I would say there's some uh, when I'm talking about content, I'm talking about a deeper engagement with the words of our tradition. And I would also add, you know, the concepts of our tradition. Like, you know, how much money should we give away? Um, or what does it mean to, um, you know, to take sexuality in the context of a religious life seriously? Um, what does it mean to live a life where you care about what you eat, right? Um, you know, I mean, the, the, the sort of food movement is a great example of, um, you know, a, a modern American cultural moment of people actually caring about grass-fed and organic and all that. And that has a tremendous, Jewish tradition has a tremendous amount to say about the sources of food, how you acknowledge your food, um, how you treat your, your, your food source, you know, the, the, the cattle, etc. Um, that's all there. But it's fundamentally been passed over in a world where Jewish... Um, uh, content has been boiled down to, you know, eight candles on Hanukkah kind of experience. You're, you're, you know, your you're third grade Hebrew school, that's where people leave off, is their bar mitzvah. So I would say that you're, you're in a world where the, the, the most relevant engaging questions of the modern world are addressed in Jewish sources, and we don't have anybody opening those sources up to those questions. Um, is it safe to say, or did I understand this correctly, that um, these minyanim are kind of a, a very positive means, but that the ultimate goal would be to uh, to become a part of the more traditional minyan uh, of a more traditional uh, movement or more traditional uh, synagogue or or. Uh, uh, you know, in other words, yes, this certainly beats out going to the ball game on Shabbat morning or hanging out and doing nothing, you know, or watching TV. And, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a, a very positive step in the right direction. Is it a goal, like, in and of itself, and, and this, is, this is where, you know, where we expect it to stay uh, for these people, or is the, uh, is the thinking that hopefully this will lead one to a more traditional or conventional, uh, you know, 
uh, form of uh, of Judaism, right? You know, in in a synagogue with with all of the trappings that we are kind of accustomed to. So I'm glad you asked the question. Let me draw a distinction here between what you framed as a goal and what I would say as a possibility. Um, and, and, and to say it that way, I would say the goal is absolutely not as a halfway house towards a more institutional affiliation. The goal is about connecting to the wisdom of the Jewish tradition and the divine. That's the goal. The goal, that's the goal of religion. The goal of religion is not to affiliate and pay dues. The goal of religion is to connect to something deeper that actually is guiding my life and giving me a reason to be religious. That's the goal. Now, what will happen is a different story, right? And I think in, in, you know, in, in that framework, I would say, I personally am in favor of people who, when in their 20s are part of a minion, in their 30s join a synagogue. Because unless you're going to start another synagogue in your 30, uh, another minion in your 30s, your choices are basically join a synagogue or go back to your bedroom. And I would prefer people to be in a synagogue than in their bedroom because then there's a lot of value to a synagogue. But I think that framing that as the goal, like I said, well, well it's good, but it's not as good as joining the synagogue. I would say that's not the way I look at it at all in terms of goals. And that's why I would say that the synagogue itself might want to reorient the goal of the synagogue. In other words, what's the synagogue driving for? More members. But I would say that's actually not a good orientation for a synagogue. The synagogue should be drawing for more meaning. And the members will come, right? That's the way to think about it. And if there's no meaning, so then I'm not interested in people joining as members. And if there is meaning, I'm very interested in people joining. Um, so I think that, you know, um, you know, when you ask what happens to these people, what, what happens to the alumni of these minyanim, um, many of them, I, me myself, here's my, the end of my story. I was in the Upper West Side. I met my wife at the Minion. You know, Kanai Nahara was the, that was the reason alone to do it. And then uh, uh, we had a kid. And then we realized we were in one bedroom with no with no natural light. So we left the Upper West Side. So um, uh, we we moved to Washington Heights. And in Washington Heights, now that I have a kid, now I have two kids. No way am I starting another Minion. I don't have the time. So we joined the synagogue. But what's interesting about the synagogue that we joined, and we joined proudly, we paid membership dues. But what's interesting about the synagogue we joined, and this sort of, sort of speaks to the impact that these minyanim have on the clergy, the rabbi that the synagogue hired uh, about a year after we got there is a graduate, as it were, of these minyanim. Um, he, he went to Adar on the Upper West Side, and now he's you know, a clergy member who's running a traditional synagogue with multiple ages, etc., um, but really is sort of was inculcated in the uh, culture of what it would mean to create a meaningful worship experience around participation. Um, so we're sort of proud members of this synagogue, and I, again, I don't have any institutional loyalty. I don't have any institutional loyalty towards synagogues or against them. I'm really loyal to people who can have a religious life, and wherever that takes place, I'm for it. So I think that, you know, I, I for one, hope that the synagogues move in that direction where they're engaging in the goal of religious connection, and I'm the first to <laughs> tell people to sign up for those, uh, those synagogues. Sir. Yes. Um, uh, you had said the demographic of Adar people are mostly young people, maybe pre-family. Uh, are there members or are there participants in, the, in these minions that may have children? And if so, is there thinking about the education, the Jewish education of the very young? And, and how do you see, like, the benefits of leading them? What, what would be the Yeah, so the, the question on education of your kids in these minions is very interesting. I would say that most of the minyanim don't deal with it because most of them are in, taking place in urban areas where the sort of reality of urban renewal is such that when you have a child or two, you leave the you know, urban areas. I would say that's the sort of delayed um, you know, move to the suburban areas. Um, but there are some minyanim that, that do have people who are sticking around and they're having kids there. Um, and then you have this interesting question about what would an independent minion uh, uh, experience of Hebrew school look like. There's actually a place in, uh, in Princeton, New Jersey. This was an interesting uh, development where it was an independent minion that started. It was a little bit in cahoots with the uh, Hillel um, that was there. And the people who founded it were also interested in founding their own Hebrew school. They called it Yerusha. Um, and the, the, basically their take on Hebrew school was, well, the main problem with Hebrew school is there's no buy-in from the parents educationally, and the kids hate going there because it's, you know, after school and sitting in a classroom and it's, you know, boring. So, um, so what they did is they said, we're going to do a parent co-op approach to Hebrew school. 
um, which means that all the parents are involved, and the kids, you know, aren't misbehaving when their parent is teaching the class, or less, of, or I don't know exactly how that works out, but fundamentally, it's it's not the same problems that they're dealing with in a typical Hebrew school. Now, their prob their challenge is that they're dealing with basically a barrier of an upper barrier of whatever the highest level of education of the parents are, as opposed to someone who's trained to be a teacher. Let's say, although most Hebrew school teachers are not necessarily trained to be teachers, um, but it's it's sort of like a do-it-yourself Hebrew school parent co-op which is one interesting model that's happening. I and mean, I think the other question is basically what's happening to day schools in America, Jewish day schools, where the fundamental, and I would say this crisis is just getting revved up, where, you know, basically people can't afford to send their kids to day school. And yet you have um, people who are dying to give their kids a Jewish education. So this is interesting that's happening in Boston. You have this, it's, it's unbelievable to me, but there are people who are starting in the, in the minion there uh, um, in Brookline to basically say, well, we can't afford day school, even though there's plenty of good day schools in Boston. We just can't shell out the cash for day school. But the Hebrew school once a week is kind of a joke. So we're going to start a four-day week Hebrew school, which is exactly the model that Boston had 60 years ago. I mean, my parents went to a four-day week Hebrew school all the way through college. Um, and it's basically a way of saying, we're not ready to mortgage our financial future to get our kids a Jewish education by paying the day school fees, but we're not going to sort of be satisfied with the alternative, which is sort of like a one day a week um, you know, education light. So that's the other thing that's sort of developing around the corner. But I would say nobody's really figured out what to do on the education front just because of the sort of financial economic realities of what it means to give people a Jewish education today. What's, what's the program of your yeshiva? So um, the, the program of the yeshiva is uh, basically we have two programs. One is a summer immersion, it's like eight weeks, and one is a year-round immersion, it's nine months. Um, and the, the curriculum is, it's interesting, traditionally yeshiva curriculum was Talmud and then Talmud. Right? So we have Talmud in the mornings uh, because Talmud is really fundamentally the, still the core Jewish text that's the hardest to get into, it takes the most decoding, it's sort of the iconic text that people learn. Um, but then in the afternoon we have theology, I teach liturgy, um, it's, uh, you know, it's other approaches, we have sort of a modern topics of Jewish law, um, it's, it's ways in which people can connect Judaism to their real life. I would say that's driving the curriculum. Judaism shouldn't be something that I learn because I have to learn it, or I learn it because it's sort of, you know, a little bit boring, but uh, what I can do, I'm Jewish. But it's no, this is actually speaking to the core issues of my life, that's why I'm learning it. And I would say that the major innovation, which is you know, relevant for the uh, Staten Island community, is that you don't have to now show up for eight weeks or a year to, to connect. You can either go online, if you just Google Hadar, you'll find it, H-A-D-A-R. Or we have you know, week-long programs. We have a college winter learning seminar. People come during college break and come for four days and learn that way. We have a you know, week-long seminar in, in July for people who are uh, able to take off those days. And it's, uh, it's, that's actually where the age, the age issue is not, um, is not defining. It's, it's really a place where people of all ages can learn. It just depends on which way they're sort of engaging with those, with those texts. So. Any further questions? We have time for one more. So, um, I want to thank uh, Rabbi Khan for, for uh, really bringing up an issue on uh, everyone's mind is involved with the Jewish community, certainly, in terms of institutional affiliation. And for more broadly, uh, bringing up the issue of uh, religious affiliation in this country, you spoke about mega churches, and I know in the Christian community there's breakaways as well, uh, in terms of small prayer groups as well. There was a news week article on this uh, two or three years ago, a cover article on this movement, which mentioned the independent media movement as well. Uh, so this is really a national trend in terms of mainline establishment religion trying to refocus itself and recenter itself. Um, and this idea of making meaning in our institutions. Um, as opposed to simply making numbers, is a very profound, very profound point, I think. Mr. Bayless has one more point. Yes. Um, if I may ask another question. Well, we do have three or four minutes, so please go. Um, how does the Torah fit into this, uh, into uh, Hadar? Torah's key. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right there in the middle, <laughs> I would say. Um, yeah, look, the Torah is, I mean, the Torah, if we're talking about the five books of Moses, or Torah more generally, Jewish wisdom. Um, why am I Jewish? Because God gave us the Torah that gives us a tremendous approach to the wisdom of our people that speaks to the current realities of, of my life. 
And I would say that um, if I weren't engaged in Torah study broadly, I, I'm not sure why I would be, why Judaism would be compelling as a sort of religious experience. And I know that there's obviously a grand tradition of Judaism as a culture and Judaism as a people. I'm sympathetic to that 100%. But I would say that there, the Torah has been undersold in modern America. And I feel like it's either off-putting or scary or old Bible religion and you read the, you know, the guy who you know, lived the year biblically and you think it's wacky. But really, it's, it's very deep and, and very compelling. And I think that you know, where I ultimately um, see the future uh, of Jewish life is one that connects to Torah, which means teaching. Um, I believe in you know, the Jewish teachings. So I'm happy to speak afterwards. And also, the, the book um, that's for sale outside has um, practical stuff related to synagogues and um, fun, easy to read sections. So and it's my obligation to um, also make mention of the Chai Society, which is the uh, Jewish um, affinity group that supports Jewish life at Wagner. Uh, this lecture series in partnership with the JCC of Staten Island, JCC Educational Director Yafra Schoenbach, who would like to work in the series, is here this evening. Thank you. Um, and uh, also brings together the community and um, the academy through forums such as this. So um, I hope that many of you will come to me afterwards and ask me questions about the Sky Society and more broadly about Wagner College. And uh, certainly Yafa there is able to answer any questions regarding the JCC. But do ask me about the Sky Society. It does really interesting, in terms of our programming, I would say really intellectually competitive work. Um, and sometimes controversial, but that's OK. That's what we're here to do in an academic institution, um, which is to raise questions that each of us then has to think through our own response to. Uh, so thank you all for being here. Thank you to our students uh, for coming out. Um, and I hope you come back. The next one is um, held at the JCC on the Chabad movement, our next public program, 8 p.m. It is uh, Tuesday evening, November uh, 7th. It will be the uh, first Tuesday in November. Yes, the first Tuesday in November, 8 p.m. at JCC, um, and then back here in February for a discussion of the designers of the day. Um, thank you, Rabbi Conqueror, for a very important talk.